Hello, welcome to Biggest Little Library. I'm Amy Newberry. And I'm Tammy Ruff, and we're two librarians discussing all the books in the stacks. The new and notable. The lost and forgotten. The hot and the not. So let's get to it. Hello, listeners. We'd love to tell you about the revamp of our Patreon site. As a Patreon supporter, you're going to get early access to all of our episodes, monthly polls about our reading choices, seasonal book lists, mini sewed videos, an additional newsletter, and bonus content that is too numerous to list here. This month, we're giving everyone a free glimpse of all the goodness we offer our Biggest Little Library supporters on Patreon. Check it out at patreon.com backslash Biggest Little Library or link through our website or even click right here on the show notes of this podcast. See, See you in the stacks. stacks. So we're really excited today. We have an amazing guest joining us, and her name is Debbie Steers, and she's a good friend of mine, and I had her son in my library class. He was a great great student librarian, by the way. Uh, Debbie is the... mm, Collection Same. Development Manager. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it's a mouthful, it but is. it's a big job. And she's worked for Washoe County Library for six years, and she's going to tell us all things about her purchasing and what she does and how she makes this amazing library system work. Can I ask you something, though? This is not on the questions. How big is the Washoe County Library? Like, how many people do you service, essentially, for Washoe County? So we service the entire population of Washoe County, which is up to, I think, about 480,000 Holy residents. Smoke. So that's a lot of people it that is. you buy books for. Okay, so let's jump in. All right. Tams. So we are recording in the downtown Reno Library, and we thought we would ask you, first of all, a, a little bit of the history of this site. What you Because like for to our listeners who don't know, this is the most beautiful library it is. So this building was built in 1966. It was designed by Hewitt C. Wells, who is a somewhat famous um, modern architect of the, you know, mid-century modern is really popular right now. Yes, it is. I don't know if you know, he also designed what was City Hall and is now the Discovery Center. Oh, the Discovery oh Museum, I didn't know that. Kitty Corner from I here. And so that. now that you know that, you'll look oh, at yeah. the building and see, <laughs> see the similarities. similarities. Okay. And they've done a great job of changing that from a uh, a city hall into a really family-friendly museum. But the best story, and if, if people haven't been in this library, it is full of plants. I've never seen anything like it. It's true. When I, I first came to Reno scoping out, is this a place I want to live? I had my Apple iPod was my way to connect to the internet, <laughs> and I needed Wi-Fi. And so I thought, I'm going to go find the library and connect to the Wi-Fi and get the information that I need. And I walked in and I thought... I have never seen a library with Mm -hmm. so many plants. So the story is that the architect had his eye on a piece of property in Idlewild Park by the river. And that the city said, oh, no way are you going to put a library by a river. It's going to flood. Water and books are a horrible combination. Here, you can have this piece of land in the center of the city. And so he said, well, if I can't put my library in the park, I want to put the park in the library oh my mm-hmm. goodness and I there didn't you, i didn't know that either yeah. well it makes it's like a jungle in here it is like a jungle we have an avocado tree that <gasps> does it fruit it it's not supposed to fruit you're supposed to have both the male and female oh, right. but, right. but urban legend is once in a while it really does produce an avocado <laughs> oh, <nice>. and then <laughs> we have somebody who's responsible for caring for all the plants and he comes and waters every oh, week oh, but that's got to be a job like that's a whole nother episode that job <laughs> Right. It is. These are giant trees, too. I mean, this isn't just house plants. People who are listening, it, they're giant trees. Yeah, like, it's what is this? sort of a three-story atrium. Mm-hmm. It yeah. is. It's huge. This was my library growing up as a kid, and I loved coming in, and I would always say, we're going to go across the jungle bridge to my yes. mom as we came in. So we have a guest appearance. I said we have somebody who comes and waters every week. Oh, there This is Leon, is. who really does... <laughs> All the watering. <laughs> Lovely. Leon. All nice. right. That's quite a job. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Okay. So what else about this place? So this is our main branch for our system. We have eight full service libraries throughout the county. And then we have partnerships that we have a location at our senior center. And then three school partnerships that during the day, they function as a school library. And we host um, evening and weekend hours to the public. Wow. Okay. I love that. That is pretty cool. Is that still Mendive? Is it Mendive one of them? It's not Mendive. We used okay. to have more. And then as we opened branches, so as we opened Spanish oh. Springs and opened South Valleys, those neighborhoods lost their school libraries because they then okay. had a, a full service 
library. But um, we have one in Verdi, one at Glen Duncan Elementary School, and then Gerlach, which is a oh, whole right. fun place to go. It's like it's way out there. It is way out there. Mm -hmm. When I was first starting to get into the teaching world, they were really trying. Do you remember the fair? The teaching Uh fair? The girl like principal was like tap dancing to get people to come over to his table because they were desperate for teachers Uh back in the day. That's true. Okay. So uh, the next question that we have for you is top. Okay. Every year at the end of the year, I get this really cool infographic from your library that tells me what are the top moving fiction and nonfiction. And I was hoping we could get a sneak peek at what that is. And I'm just dying to know what are people in mm-hmm. Reno reading? All right. So as you know, with COVID, these are strange times. Yes. yes. We were open for quite a, a stretch of time, able to offer curbside pickup, drive through pickup. And as the numbers have increased, we've closed that down. So it's really our digital library that yeah. is the mm-hmm. way we can connect users with books. So I jumped onto Overdrive, pulled the stats of what has the most holds. And it was fun for me to see what other people are reading. You know, one of the things yeah. we experience with digital content is our users are invisible to us. Right. So we're used to folks coming into the building, choosing their book, we get to see them, you know, they ask us questions about mm-hmm. what to read. And when users are doing that from their phone, from their laptop, we don't see what they're doing. And we sometimes forget just how many people are out there using our electronic yeah. resources. And that's only increased with, with COVID. But um, it, none of these are surprises. So Drum roll. The, <laughs> the most in-demand fiction title right now is Daylight by Baldacci. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so those, those thriller mm-hmm. mystery yeah. books are huge. I think part of it is both men and women read them. Yeah, true. Because a, a lot of the books, only women read them. But, right. So Baldacci is, is huge. Lisa Foley's Guest List. It's the second oh. most popular. Okay. Yep. We get a literary fiction title, Britt Bennett's Vanishing Half. Okay. Uh, comes in third. Okay. So we don't want to forget about our literary readers. But then ran- rounding it out, we've got Michael Connolly, Lee Child, John Grisham, Stephanie Meyer. So we've got a young adult. Oh, okay. Okay. She came out with her the new, fifth Twilight. Yes, her new one. Sun. Um, Anxious People, Frederick Bachman. Yeah. That's the, interesting because that, that just came out not too long. When did that come out? It was like... Recently. Right. And that's already your number. Okay. All right. What else? Ready Player Two. Of course. So if you liked Ready Player One, we've got the the follow-up. And then rounding it out is uh, Tana French's The Searcher. Oh, Oh. I did read in Kirkus about that one. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I'm going to turn the tables on you. Can you predict what the hottest nonfiction title is right now? A Promised Land. You got it. Oh, <laughs> superstars. Yeah. And I'm just going to say, if, if our listeners can hear all that racket back there, the plants are getting watered right now. So you're getting an extra like slice of the downtown life. So but to give you an idea, we have over 250 users waiting for that next you're copy kidding. of the wow. ebook. Okay. How many of those did you purchase? How many do you have in your system for digital? Because that's part of it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's we have your job. It's trying to determine... We have like 45 copies. What? So mm. we, we don't want people to have to wait forever to get a book. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. And just as the Libby app, Overdrive, it's all the same company. They make it really easy to use. They make it really easy for libraries to just dial into what is it people want. It's all of a one-click process. I go, oh, my goodness, I've got 15 people right. per copy waiting on hold. That's too long. Nobody wants to wait six months to read a book. It's, it's true. It's true. I was on for 16 <laughs> weeks for a Mexican Gothic, and Amy finally bought it. I'm like, hey, I'm down here. I found it. Do you want me to bring this home to you? She's like, yes, please. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't like to wait. People are immediate. Okay, so that's number one. That's number one. Um, Untamed, Glennon Doyle. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I've heard that's excellent. Uh, Green Lights, Matthew McConaughey. Right. I just got that. I just acquired that for my library. Mm-hmm. Kind of my favorite book of the year, Cast. Oh, oh yes. I have two copies. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, Atomic Habits. So this is yes. combined. So I, I looked at what has the most holds in Overdrive, and this is looking both at ebooks and audiobooks. 
Those okay. business and self-help titles are so popular on audio. That's mm-hmm. fascinating. Well, I like audiobooks for nonfiction, and I've been making my way through the Malcolm Gladwell catalog, oh, yeah. and I walk my neighborhood, and I listen, and I love, because his are, you know, short, kind of chunky um, examples of whatever his thesis is that he's, you know, exploring, and I love that, because I'm like, oh, 45 minutes, okay, click, I'm off right now, and then tomorrow I click it on again, and I get the next one. So I do, too. I read, if I'm, if I'm reading a, a physical book or an ebook. I fiction I only want in in, in print. Print. Me too. And for yeah, audio, this I'm much more likely to listen to audio. Mm-hmm. That that is fascinating because we had this very same conversation and we were doing a, an episode on audiobooks mm-hmm. and we both listened to something and we both picked a nonfiction. But then Right after that, we were doing Stephen King, and I was trying to make my way through The Stand, which you know is like over 1,100 pages. <laughs> and so I'm like, I got to capitalize on my... We were driving back and forth to Almanor, which is a two-hour drive. And so that was the first book I think I listened to that was fiction that I enjoyed on audio, because I usually like only want nonfiction. So yeah. interesting. Okay. I like them too for the blind community because I think that that, you know, that having the audiobooks for them is, is phenomenal. And, and I know that it was hard in my own little library to get enough large print for people who have yeah. vision impairments. And so the audiobooks I thought were really, you know, fantastic for those yeah. folks too. I was just going to ask you something and I totally lost my train of thought, but it was about what we were just talking about. I was going to say, I think the reason I want to read fiction is what you imagine in your mind is so rich that hearing somebody else's voice tell that story really detracts for me from the experience. You know, now that you say that, I would have to agree. I think we're soul sisters. That's exactly (laughs) it for me. Yeah. It could be the wrong narrator. The whatever it is pulls me out of the story. I think you're exactly right. Maybe some of your, your listeners will experience this. I have the same difficulty if I see an NPR personality and I both hear their voice and see their persona, it's hard for me to reconcile the two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Last year I was working in the kitchen. I was doing some baking. And so I was reading for, I was listening to Frederick Bachman's Bear Town. And I got, I, initially I really liked it, but then I got so annoyed with the person's voice that I'm like, I gotta, I have to shelve it. I have to go read it because I can't handle her anymore. So it's kind of funny how our brain plays tricks on us when you're listening to something versus mm-hmm. what you want to create in your head and how you want to hear it. And I imagine if there's a, a movie version coming out of a book that you've meant to read, you want to read the book before you yes. see the movie for the same reason. Exactly. And if it happens that I see the movie first, I very rarely go back to the book. Yep. Agreed. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. Weird, right? I know. I think that's just how it is. Huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do want to ask you, though, um, what, it, how has, and this is maybe a question further down the line, but I'm just going to, I'm going to jump right into it. With the, this whole global pandemic, how has audio and digital, like, what are your circulation rates? Has it changed? Have you noticed something it's different? Through the roof. Um, yeah. So, Fairly early into the closure with the killing of George Floyd, America really embraced how do we examine racism in our society Mm -hmm. and and what can we do to change it and understand it better. And so we had this huge uptick. Both It was frustrating because we had books on our shelves, but our libraries were closed. And publishers and overdrive really came through and released simultaneous use copies so that we could have hundreds in the community at the same time reading about something because again people didn't want to wait three years for their turn at a book and so they really chose um one of the big ones was how to be an anti-racist and it's still one of our most popular titles and it was such a service to the community to be able to provide that access we just didn't have the means to buy enough licenses to have that many people read it. That's pretty, that's impressive. So the publishers then, did they allow you to sort of switch the way you had those in the um, catalog before? Did If you had like a single download, did you, could you say, we need like 10 or 20 now? Is that something that yeah, so can happen? I'm, I'm glad that you asked that because it licensing of, of eBooks and downloadable audiobooks doesn't make sense to to end users typically because you think well it's a digital file it's as easy for 
a thousand people to read that ebook at the same time as it is for one person. Right. But the publishers really looked at the music industry and the mistakes that the music industry made as it went digital. And so publishers worked hard to protect their investments to make sure that they were getting paid, they could pay their authors, which we certainly support. We, Absolutely. we want authors yeah. to be paid fairly yes. and we want publishers to stay in business. And so the publishing industry at first really didn't want to work with public libraries and then came up with a licensing program. So each publisher kind of sets their own rules. But typically what happens is we buy a single license that allows one person at a time to do that. So when we talked about Barack Obama's book has over 250 holds, Mm -hmm. that means we have to buy multiple copies just as we would of a physical book. Okay. Wow. Quite, that's quite fascinating. Only because we come at it from like the high school, right? You know, library realm, and that's not. How does it compare financially? Is it still like yeah. a twenty-five dollar? You know, like you would buy the book for twenty-five. Is the ebook the same? So it's a constantly changing world. Um, when it first started, ebooks were ebooks and audiobooks were about eighty-five dollars a copy, and you bought it and you owned it forever, and mm-hmm. so. It's hard when, you know, you take a promised land and there's that much demand. You don't want to pay $85 for every copy. Right. And so publishers have started to say, well, you know, when you buy our physical book, it wears out. Somebody drops it in the bathtub. It is not an everlasting copy that you buy and put on your shelves. And so different publishers have gone to different models of of how they will license those for us we don't actually own the book we don't have control over it we just license to be able to use it under their terms and so some of those have come down in price my favorite model is you get 26 checkouts for 26 dollars, and when those 26 checkouts expire you can buy more copies and and so that's a more affordable way for us to do it completely yeah yeah that's crazy it was hard having a high school library and trying to navigate all of that mm-hmm. ebook stuff because mm-hmm. there were choices like that where you had one book, one checkout, and then you'd have, well, you can have five simultaneous, but you only get them for a year. And then, you know, our budgets were pretty small and you're trying to figure out, okay, if I have the paper copy, how many times can that be checked out versus mm-hmm. if I have three of them or if I have, you know, the e-copy and then trying to get kids to download it. It was kind of a struggle. We always used to send them to the library. We'd mm-hmm. say, go to the public library. It's Overdrive and, and Libby. It's I so can't much easier. compete with the way you guys present it. I really mm-hmm. can't. And I think it's kind of silly to attempt to because my kids, well, I think all teenagers are, they, they are immediate creatures. Yep. They they want to see it, touch it, feel it. And so for me to try to figure out how to promote that in my library where I have limited time with them, as opposed to I made a video for how to check out on Libby and sent it out to all my English teachers. And so then their kids are figuring out how to access their public library, which I believe is a better service for their lifetime because they're going to leave high school. Mm-hmm. They're going to check Good out point. from me anymore and they're going to come check out from you. So, So we were excited to see that Overdrive looked at, wow, we've really saturated the public library market. The folks we haven't reached as well are students. And so they have launched a new program and we're partnering with Washoe County Schools for this. They call it Sora, but it allows students to use their login credentials that they use all the time at school and to directly connect to our Overdrive collection. So they're able to have access to the the huge number of titles that That's we have. That's so exciting. But do it you remember is. we went to that conference? We did. We had a breakfast with, with, with uh, Sora. Sora. And I was folks. like, how do we get this at Washoe County? <laughs> well, now you've answered that question. Mm-hmm. So thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about how your library has functioned since this onset of COVID-19. Like, what are you guys, how are you, how are you, how are you dealing with all this? Y- you know, I think every aspect of life is faced with how do we make the best of this? How do we figure out what our priorities are and do what's important to us? And I think what will be exciting is to see the ways we have grown and changed as a result of this. So there were several things that for a few years we've been saying, gosh, 
I wish we could do that, but there was always a little hang up. You know, it was 90% of the way of being successful, Mm -hmm. but we could just never find that 10% to, to get it fully successful. And so when we closed our doors suddenly, it really was that chance of like, look, if we're 90% of the way to, to having something that works, we need to just make it work. And it has to be good enough because we don't want to cut people off from, from all of these resources and services. And it's, it's been exciting. So a couple of the things that have happened are we always wanted to be able to have people sign up for a library card on the website without having to come in to have instant access. So, you know, somebody yes. hears about, oh, you have Overdrive. I'd love to, to know how to download an audiobook and listen to it on my phone. It used to be cumbersome because we'd say, well, find where your library is located, what hours they're open, have ID, go and get a library card. So that was one of the first things that we did. Our internet services librarian figured out, all right, here's here's how to make it automatic to issue that card. And we have issued over 15,000 new library cards. Oh, bravo. <laughs> I love that. Both. So, so two ways That's of awesome. doing that. About 11,000 through that online form. Um, you know, we reached out wow. to our school partners and said, look, we know kids are all sent home from school. You don't have access to your school libraries. You're trying to, to have your students learn from home. We want to make sure you have access to our collections. We had publishers reach out. Tumble Books expanded mm-hmm. and gave us a lot of offerings that we hadn't been able to, to offer to the community before. Um, so about 11000 through our own website. And then Overdrive, about a year and a half ago, was really smart and said, you know, we want to make this easier for people because, of course, the more demand, the more content we're buying and, and they yeah. make money off of it. Yeah. Um, but they started a program where when you log into Overdrive, whether you do it on your computer or on your phone, the first screen that pops up says, don't have a library card, enter your cell phone number, and it will issue an overdrive card to you. It doesn't give you, it's not as good because it only gives you access to overdrive, but still, but it gives you that instant access. And so nice. since we closed in March, we had another about 4,500 people sign up for that. That is amazing. And it's really a smart system because it knows even if you don't have a 775 area code, it's able to tell that you live in Washoe County or are entitled to a Washoe County library card. That is I love that. amazing. That goes yes. way beyond my technical expertise. <laughs> I don't know how they make that happen, but that's really cool. And so, you know, one of the other things that we did is um, our, our director, Jeff Scott, has been excellent in ensuring that using the library is safe for the public and for staff. And we've gotten great feedback from the community that they appreciate whatever we can do. Mm-hmm. They're happy that it's a place that they can come. And when when we have been able to be open for grab-and-go service, whether it's through our branches that have a drive through or branches that, that have a lobby space open and have one person come in at a time, and, and clean between folks. Yeah, right. Um, it's it's been exciting to see people come back, and the you know the comments from people like I'm so happy to have you I back. I know, I know. So we're hoping in in January to be able to reopen Open. with some you know limited model of service again. I love that. I, when I was visiting my local branch, the Northwest branch they have the drive-through and when I was picking up holds they were so adorable one of the librarians says well do you want a mystery book I'm like mystery book <laughs> yes <laughs> what are the categories <laughs> so you know I take two or three at a time I'm like thank you so much for that and I thought if I could bring a little cheer to those librarians who don't have the face-to-face with very many people like they're used to yeah. then yay yeah and it you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that is a great way to expose folks to, to new something books. new. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, how much fun is it to discover a new author? Yeah, I agree. And uh, I yeah. got a nature book and it's all about the different hikes in town. And I thought, well, now I need to buy this book because everybody's outside and doing all these things. And I thought, bravo, Washoe County Library System, because I'm thrilled with my book. I do have a question about purchasing books in translation. They're getting more popular. Do you, I was curious about books in translation to English or books that are in foreign languages and if, you know, what that looks like in the library here. So it's, it's fascinating for us to try to figure out. And one of the things that I've really tried to accomplish in the time that I've been here is I, I think of my role as 
curating a collection that reflects the needs and interests of our community. And we certainly want to reach our non-native speakers, mm-hmm. yeah. non-native English speakers in our community. And so I, I tell folks, whatever request you have for anything in a foreign language, please send to me. Like, we want to buy the materials that people want to read. It's interesting because it's it's the translated literature. So things... The Baldacci and Grisham mm-hmm. titles are po- are our most popular titles in Spanish. Really? Okay. Yeah. Huh. In my library, I got a lot of them uh, in Spanish that were Stephen King titles mm-hmm. because the kids mm-hmm. knew those titles. And when we were trying to encourage them to be or Harry reading, Potter, they, they really yep. wanted it. Yeah, yeah, I was curious about that. Is it easy to find? Well, probably not that many people think of it, but a book that's in French that you know, they want in English. I don't know how often that happens. Maybe that's more in a, like a UNR academic library. I don't know. You know, certainly classic literature. um, Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of what we think Mm -hmm. of as the canon was written in French or German. Right. Um, That's a good question. And, and, it's always a harder sell. I mean, there are some authors, you know, the Nobel Prize winners in literature, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, they often are non-English writers um, and not hugely popular. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Not hugely popular, meaning I haven't heard of them until they won the award, by the way. Right. 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 That would be my definition of hugely popular. Yeah. Hey friends, we're introducing something new this year. Each Friday, we'll be dropping a mini-sode featuring four book recommendations from the Circulation Desk, which happens to be the recommendation hub of every library. It'll be fast and fun and give you some titles for your TBR. See See you in the stacks. stacks. I would like to know because you have, I mean, in our conversations, every time we sit down, you have such knowledge of what's coming down like you really have your pulse on the publishing industry what's coming out what's going to be here what to buy what's going to be hot what's going to be popular you know I keep a spreadsheet right by date I'm not (laughs) I am not at all surprised to hear that and I like kind of want to peek at that but what are you most excited about for 2021 what book coming out oh (laughs) you should say I love your face I have one for you all right what I'm super excited about for your Washoe County readers, your Northern Nevada readers, better luck next time. It's coming out in January. Julia Claiborne Jackson, who I didn't read this earlier one, but she wrote Be Frank With Me, which was fairly popular. Okay. But better luck next time is historical fiction. Oh. Okay. Okay. I'm in. Set in 1930s, Reno. Oh my goodness. Divorce Ranch. So you have, you have sort of these cowboy characters who work at the horse ranch. You have the the lovesick divorcees coming to Reno to establish their residency, throwing their ring off the Virginia street bridge. Oh, it's very popular. Oh yeah. Going to, um, driving the the old car out to Pyramid Lake for a picnic. It's... It just hits. I mean, it's 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 really fun historical fiction, but the fact that it's such a fascinating time yeah. in Reno and mm-hmm. and something that is so unique to Reno, it's it's just thrilling. Who's, do you know who the publisher is on that? <sighs> no. Was that too hard of a question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just wondering if we could get it on NetGalley or Edelweiss. I you can, because you can. that's how I read the yeah. ARC on. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, my gosh. We, we have to look that up. So we that's what it. my spreadsheet is is like I compulsively especially this time of year I am looking at what was you know what was the best of of 2020 but I really want to know what are folks talking about for 2021 that I don't want to miss and going to Edelweiss and NetGalley and trying to get those digital copies so how do we as library users that maybe don't know what's coming up, but we want to be first in that queue of getting the yeah. digital copy, how do, we, how do we know what's coming to get in there until it's in the system? That's a great question. So yeah. we actually don't heavily promote it because 
the when a book comes out is when it is the most popular. And so um, whether you're reading People Magazine or Real Simple, we probably, you know, come across 20 different magazines that that list books that are coming out. Um, that's a great way, but everybody wants them at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you're an industry insider, like you have a podcast or you, you purchase for a library, NetGalley and Edelweiss are so exciting to be able to have that opportunity. And I, I'm completely obnoxious because my favorite parlor game is Oh, I've read that. <laughs> oh, it's right. <laughs> I read that before it came out. So I, I totally want to predict what's going to be hot, and I want to have read it before well, anybody else. Well, it's funny because on NetGalley, I saw Kristen Hanna's new book that's coming out in February, and I thought I should request that, but I have been so bogged down with all my reading, I haven't even had a chance to request it. So let me ask, has your reading, your personal reading changed during oh, COVID? Oh, yeah. Well, I think our personal reading changed. Maybe I'm speaking for you, but I'll let you answer this too. Because of our podcast. Oh. Like, I would say this has probably been the richest reading year I've had yet. Mm -hmm. But because we were being really strategic and thoughtful in the way we're approaching our reads, what would, what would you say? Yes, I think I'm, I'm definitely reading more. Mm -hmm. I think I'm 22 books ahead of, you know, where I was last year just uh, because of the podcast. And then just as you said, where you're looking at a magazine or I get Kirkus and I read through Kirkus and then I'm like, oh, I want to read that one and that one and that one. And we use Goodreads and I put them on there and, you know, over 300 books I want to read. And it's, <laughs> it's hard to get them to kind of, you know, float to the top of which one you're like, oh, do I read this one or do I read this one? And then the way our formats have worked, we've tried to, you know, sort of curate um, specific topics for for the um, podcast. And so then I'm reading something that maybe wasn't already on my list, but then I'm finding something that fits our episode that I really want to read. So I feel like it's much richer and the quantity is much more i can't She's wait way ahead of me i can't wait till the end of the year when we get the infographic from um, on goodreads. goodreads oh yeah uh, so you guys put me to shame because let me say i have had a harder time concentrating i am typically mm -hmm. a a pretty pure literary fiction reader right and i when i was in library school Maybe one of my favorite takeaways from library school was in a class on collection development, and we we're studying different genres, and the professor said, you know, literary fiction, it's those books where nothing much happens to people you don't much like. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and I thought, so oh, it's true, because <laughs> if I try to describe a book that I absolutely yeah. love yeah. – to somebody who doesn't read literary fiction, they look at me like... That's probably that's... my favorite category, <laughs> but I would agree with you. It, not a lot happens. And then, like, you give it to people with so much enthusiasm, and they're like, rah, rah, rah. It just doesn't, like, they, and then I'm like, that they're not a literary fiction reader. I have that with a few people in my life where I'm like, I can't give that to them. But what I found for myself is I'm going a little towards the fluffy because COVID. With COVID. Yeah. And our, we see that with our users. So cozy mysteries and romance are the cheapest thing for us to buy on Overdrive. It is so ridiculously inexpensive and so popular that <laughs> it's really nice because it helps us average out our, our cost. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I read um, an Ellen Hildebrand. 20, oh, right. 28 summers, 29 summers, uh -huh. some okay, some number of summers that I never would have read before. And, you know, I try to think, well, this will help me understand readers of, yeah, of, of course. popular fiction. And you know what? <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I have to tell you, my daughter, the Taryn, that's 25, that's at home right now because of COVID. And um, she's a huge reader. And, and uh, romance is her genre. She's read a 216 books so far. That's the last time I talked wow. to her a couple I know. days ago. But she's using pretty exclusively the, the Libby app. And she listens and she reads. And, you know, about every two days, sometimes one a day. So she's probably one of your number one romance, you know, downloaders. <laughs> and, and there really are people who will go through a book a day. Yeah, that's crazy to me. Mm -hmm. So I do have to say, one of my favorite experiences of working with, with Amy at school was we were working together at the school library, <laughs> turning kids on to overdrive. And one of the students said, well, 
if I have to read a book for class, can I listen to it and have that count? And, you know, I was really happy to see Amy set the record straight. I'm like, yes, listening yes. counts as reading. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, you know, there's a debate at it at our school. There's some teachers that say, no, it doesn't. And some, and they're not even like English teachers. They're just like teachers who are, it doesn't. Yes, it does. And it's kind of funny. And I always look at the person who's on the other side. I'm like, I'm like yeah, it does. It counts. <laughs> I don't care what anybody else says. We just want you using the, right. you know, all these great resources. So with that in mind, all of the books from this year, do you do you use Goodreads? Do you set a reading goal? You know, no pressure here. I, we I just do are use curious. Goodreads. I never meet my goal. And mm. this year, one of the things that I have found is I have so many unfinished things on Goodreads mm-hmm. that, you know, I pick it up and I find I'm just not in the mood for it and move on to something <laughs> right. else. Do you, okay, I have to ask you though, do you classify it as like currently reading and then it never gets finished? Yep. And it, okay. It, It just shames me forever. I have figured out that that particular um, category is the kiss of death for any book that lands in my hand. So if I'm reading it and I stick it on as currently reading, it stays there forever and I never finish it. So I have decided I'm never going to put it on currently reading because I can't finish it. And you're right. It's embarrassing. I just created a new category for myself called set aside and then I switch oh. it to set aside so it comes off the currently reading. Oh good. And maybe I'll go back but usually I don't. Do you have an advanced reader c- copy category? No. no. Oh yeah yeah yeah. So I have oh. you know reading then I'm in a book club that I think oh it's nice to to be able to sort by what did we read in book club. Yeah. But then I want to know did I read it as an arc? arc. That's really Great. That's, yeah. That's actually really good. I want to know how many arcs do you think you read a year? Almost everything I read is an arc. And what's a little bit strange about me, even though I'm responsible for overseeing the buying of all of the books for the county library system, I hate to own books. I bet I don't own five books. Other than arcs. Don't get me wrong. I have a whole room that's dedicated to my arcs sorted by color. But in terms of... (laughs) You're not the only person that's told us that. We have um, Jamie and Rob. I think that's freeing. This other couple that we've had on a couple of times, they talked about not buying a book. They'll buy it if it's something they really have, you know, have a connection with and they want that copy. And so, you know, to, to reread it, but they really have exclusively used libraries. And as soon as they said that to me, I thought, you know what, that's true. You know, I, I rarely buy one, but then when I do, I usually donate it to Amy's or if it's not mm-hmm. something for her, then to this, this library system. Now I have a couple of boxes that I've had since I went through my personal library because they're not, you know, you're not taking donations right now because of course right so I have them in these lovely boxes in the garage and I thought I'm going to hang on to them because there are readers out there that want these yeah. and as soon as the COVID thing is over and you're taking donations then well I, to go in. I think I like the philosophy of there there's something about um, not hanging on to much you know once you read it and and like setting it free and letting it go and I love the idea of using the resources that our tax dollars pay for and I think it's really important that we continue to fund libraries and things that are good for our communities and I'm sorry I think libraries is probably the best thing for the, for mm-hmm, the community and mm-hmm. so when I heard they're impassioned they really have quite a philosophy on why they I was like I'm I looked at Kevin I'm like I'm not going to do that anymore I try <laughs> sometimes I cheat <laughs> and do you go back and reread? I do. I have. I do, but not terribly often. I, you know, they're... I probably reread though because I was teaching things. Right. Oh, yeah. So I'm trying to think if I reread anything that I wasn't teaching. But anytime I teach a book, I read it live with the kids because I feel like I don't want to rely on my notes. That just feels like cheating. So I've reread the All Souls trilogy by Deborah Harkness because they do a real time read. So I've gotten involved in that. And then there's a you know a couple of groups on Facebook. And so we, sort of that community of readers. Mm. Or if book club chose something that I'd read in the past, then I reread it for that um, sake. But I, I'm trying to think of something else. And I can't think of something that, you know, that I've reread. So I have two more books that are coming out this year. Okay. Ooh, sure. ooh, yeah. ooh, ooh. The, the one... I don't know if it'll be at all popular, but I'm super intrigued. Liar's Dictionary, coming out in January. But here's the description. Absurdist novel where Mallory, a publishing intern, 
works on covering, and this is a word that was totally new to me. I have to look with my bifocals. Mont weasels, which are made up entries. So there was this Victorian oh. lexi- lexiconographer okay. who was making up these words to put in dictionaries. Oh my and so <laughs> the, the book alternates in chapters, whether it's told in Victorian times or contemporary time by Mallory. And so her job is to sort out and find out which of these words were made up. And if you love language, it just sounds like a total treat. That does sound really interesting. It sounds really yeah. good. So that comes out in January. And then April, whereabouts, and I had to look up how to pronounce Jhumpa Lahari. Lahiri? Jhumpa oh, She wrote right. Lowlands, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which was just such a beautiful book. And so... Her parents were Pakistani, but she was raised in London, moved to the eastern seaboard. Um, so she's always written in English, but and she, she just has this emotional, like so descriptive. You just feel like you're part of the book. And this book, she's written in Italian. And I think, and, and so it's, oh, it is translated literature. Wow. When you talked about yes, books that are translated, yeah. it was written in Italian, which is not her native mm-hmm. English and mm-hmm. translated into English and just getting fabulous I'm reviews. Intrigued. So both I those are too. available. Those, those were on my spreadsheet when, when I nice. <laughs> thought, okay, <laughs> what am I excited about? I'll look at my, <laughs> my spreadsheet. Your magical spreadsheet. Like I, I highlight the things that, you know, I most yeah. want to read. So I get the the um, newsletters, multiple newsletters, mm-hmm. you know, by the genre from uh, the library system. When those books show up there, is that the first time then you can go in and, and request them? It's not. The- so one of our okay. goals is we, we want you to know that the library is a place that has what you want to read. And so we, we challenge ourselves. Um, I, I work with two folks. I have one person who buys adult fiction and nonfiction and another person who buys all of our children's teen and oh. audiovisual material. And all of us have this goal, like we want to be able to predict what people want and have it listed in the catalog so that when somebody goes to look for it, it's already there. We're certainly not 100% perfect. I think you're pretty good. I bet you are, yes. <laughs> but, so, so for those that we do miss, we put that link in the catalog. Didn't find what you're looking for? Let us know. And we're certainly so not smart. able to buy all mm-hmm. of those requests, but you know, in that trying to build a collection that represents the community, we want to know what are people looking for that we don't have so that we can consider adding it. And it's it's fun because some of those suggestions that just were not on our radar at all, we're always looking at how many people are on hold for an item and do we need to add more copies. So when somebody makes that recommendation, we'll add a copy to the catalog. And it's super exciting because sometimes enough people request it that we need to buy a second copy. Oh, man. Nice. I love that. This yeah. is like library in heaven right I here. Know, this whole is. conversation. Like, like, people want yes, books. Yes. People want books. Yes. Buy more books. <laughs> All right. So speaking of books, do you have um, three books that you would consider like your all-time favorites? Is this that a was hard so question? hard. I, know, I, I was going to say, it's like Sophie's Choice. I know. I'm mm-hmm. really sorry. Everybody that we ask it to are book nerds, right? Because they're <laughs> on the show with us. And they're like, this is the hardest question. I'm like, I know. We understand. Mm-hmm. All right. I narrowed it down to three, but it, it was super hard. Handmaid's Tale, okay. oh, yes. read it my first term in college in the 80s and just fell in love with it. And then my book group read it again a couple of years ago. And of course, I, I mean, it turned me on to Margaret Atwood. I love Margaret Atwood. Um, and she wrote a follow-up to it, which was super yeah. fascinating that many years later yeah. to revisit. So did you, you must have read the follow-up. I read the follow-up. I didn't, I didn't love, love the follow-up. I've heard that from people. That's okay. We give people, you know, we're the, we know that sometimes it does resonate with someone and it doesn't with someone else. So we're honest about things yeah. that we like yeah. and that didn't resonate with us. We didn't really care for it, but someone else might, it could be their number one or two or three book. And I have a whole class of authors where I love some of their writing. I either love their writing or hate their writing. Mm-hmm. So Margaret Atwood, I'm not a science fiction reader. Some of her stuff veers way, way too, too much far. for mm-hmm. science fiction for me and I just don't like it. So while you're on this, we read graphics. We did like a perfect pairing where we were reading graphics and we read graphics of classics. And I read the Margaret Atwood Handmaid's Tale and graphic. Have you seen it? No. Oh, you should. It's It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was interesting. We talked quite a bit about it. In fact, 
had a little bit of a dialogue with the illustrator of it. And um, just really, it was, I liked the book better because I saw, I read the graphic. Ah. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. So pick that up. Put that on your list. All right. <laughs> so one of my other three titles is one that stood alone for a very long time and then came with a, a sequel many, many years later. Okay. To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. yeah Ghost Set a Watchman, that. right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I loved Ghost Set a Watchman. That's interesting because a lot of people did. Yeah, a lot of people get, did yeah. not get well received. Mm-hmm. Well, in certain circles. Yeah, to me, Ghost Set a Watchman felt like a real coming of age. It, okay. It, it felt like it, it let you take a character that you had known and loved for many years and had lost touch with, and then you got to see that that person become a full adult and grapple with really difficult things in life. Okay, now I, based on that alone, because mm-hmm. I haven't read that one, I want to go read it now. I know. I haven't read it either, so that, that does right, that's make your it more appealing. Right? And you guys are teachers. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll, but, yeah. <laughs> Yay. And then my third one, um, certainly not one of her most popular works, but The Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. And such such powerful understanding through the eyes of a child. Mm. I mean, you know, sometimes people ask, what's the difference between young adult and adult? And it's it's really that, you know, the bluest eye is is definitely told with the the mind of an adult. Mm-hmm. I mean, through even though the 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 main character is a child, it is a an adult. Yeah. understanding of life interesting mm, that's you chose too. all pretty much classics i would consider all three of those i know but they're classical they they are like people read those they come back to them they're touchstones so i'm i'm gonna want to have a little snippet of you saying that <laughs> to take home to my husband because he's, he's an english <laughs> professor <laughs> and he recently said to me well you don't read literature Oh, oh no! Those words. <laughs> yes, no, he didn't. Oh yes, he did. Oh man, we're gonna have to have him on next. We'll grill him. Uh, you know, because <laughs> I think so often we think of the canon as old, dead, white European yes. men. Oh yeah. Um, no, so interesting w- that these are three American women. Yeah. Um, Yay. Yay. Go girls. we think of as as belonging in the classics. Yeah. I would definitely, well, I mean, just as an English teacher of high school, I would say, yeah, they definitely, well, two of them are taught. Wait. One of them's definitely taught all the time. And I think Handmaid's Tale is usually. I think that's senior led. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Um, Or it's a you know, a book that's recommended before you yeah. go into college. So yeah. I think, you know, for sure. It's on an AP reading list. That's what I was thinking. So let yeah. me make a plug while while you guys are on the point of what is it the high schoolers read, and especially over the summer they have to read. We would love to hear from those school teachers who assign summer reading. Let us know in March yeah. what you want your kids to read because what happens in the public library is August 4th, we got a whole right. line of people <laughs> who all want the same book, and they need it right then and there. I know. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's 30 kids from just one school alone that are looking for a title. Yeah. That is, that's yeah. great. I'll have to email my, my folks at North Valleys and remind them. Oh, oh yeah. That. So I, if they can let us know in March, we've got time. Yeah. Because we really do want to support teach. I mean, part of what's really exciting is we have these great working relationships where we just want kids to have to have access, to right. read, to understand their world. And so we want to support education year-round, whether the kids are in session or out of session. Right. So um, before we sign off and we, we want to make sure our listeners know how to get a library card, should they need it, I want to ask you one final question. What book or author is consistently popular? Like you always purchase their new books. You know that they're going to be a winner. So when you were asking, you know, What's popular right now? Yeah. It was those thriller, mystery, suspense, Baldacci, Grisham, um, Patter- you know, James Patterson comes out with a new book every week. He does. <laughs> Michael yeah. Connelly. But again, our, our Reno audience, the one that's really fun is Ellen Hopkins. Oh, of course. Who is yeah. right Local. here. Mm-hmm. Um, 
her her books serve such an important function. And mm-hmm. as a parent, you know, I I had a child who was probably fifth grade at the time who wasn't in love with reading mm-hmm. and said, oh, I need to read a book that's 400 pages long. Can you find me something that I would be interested in <laughs> at the library? So I don't know who Ellen Hopkins was, but like, look at all that white space. That's yeah. going to be some fast reading. Right. And as a parent, it was so magical to watch because Every morning, my daughter would come downstairs, oh, I've got to tell you about what I read about last night. Oh, and yeah. she was reading Crank. Oh, and my gosh. So this was in Ohio. You know, we had we had no idea where, where Reno was okay. or, or how crazy life was. And then we moved here. And I think it dawned on her first, like, wait. This yeah. is where this is where those Ellen Hopkins books yeah. took place. And what's so magical, because I can remember she would tell me the horrible things that were happening in right, this book right. of, you know, drug use and rape and yeah I, I said so pretty much you're reading about everything that as a mother I'm hoping you avoid <laughs> right. in your life and you're loving it. it it really made me see how important that young adult literature is oh man that as as those preteens and teens are grappling with wow you know, I'm, I get to make my own choices and I can make really bad choices and they could have really bad consequences. I just think it's a magical time. And so that is the set of books that we, you know, every year we check our holdings and make sure that they're still in our collection, that they haven't worn out, they haven't walked away because we know next year we're going to have that many more kids. I know. Right. Who, who are looking for those answers. So it was really fun to move to Reno and, and discover, discover that she's here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. She actually came to Reno High either last year or the year before last. And I did like a whole column of just like all of her books on display and put them in series order. And um, did, has she been to, did she ever go to North Valley's? Mm, not when I was there. She may have gone before, but I know she's very good about being active in the community. Yeah. And I went to the play. One of my uh, nieces yeah, I did too. asked about the play. Actually, sort of cold called her, cold emailed her about making it a screenplay because she was involved in, in um, acting in the community here. And so Ellen said, you know what? I think you're right. So we went, we saw it twice, even the time it was filmed because it's free on, I believe it's still free on her website. So you can watch Crank and the kids, you know, yeah. our local kids that are in it. We are really grateful that you took the time to, first of all, let us into the library. We're like the only ones in here except for the, except for Leon. Leon, watering the plants. Watering the plants. Um, I I know you wanted to say something about how people can get in touch with your resources here. Sure. So our, our website is your key to all of our, a wealth of resources. And if you go to washoecountylibrary.us, you can sign up for that instant card that will give you access. We have the New York Times is a new oh, edition. That's that, great. That, so the that's New York Times book review, yes. you can now read your New York Times book review. The only thing our library subscription doesn't give you is the Sunday crossword. So okay. if you're obsessed with the Sunday crossword, you got to go buy it. You got to buy it. But that's really Your library awesome. card will get you the New York Times. That's amazing. Thank you so much for thank spending you, time Debbie. with us today. Oh, thank what you. What a treat. This was so much fun. I loved it. I know. And we will definitely, like, we'll, you know, we'll do it again. We will. All right. Absolutely. Okay. See, See you in the stacks. stacks.